Everybody was born naked and without a SAG card. Yeah. Right? So everybody started there. You, if you want to be an actor, you've got to take every opportunity to be an actor. And, that's inter and, you, and you've got to realize that it's a self-realization uh, uh, journey. And you've got to, uh, uh, you know, I, I always joke and say, if you're a big baseball fan like I am, go to the opera. Mm -hmm. You know, see what that is like. If you uh, find yourself sitting at a dinner table with six people and everybody is, has the same political beliefs, the same religious background, and the same, you know, whatever attractiveness or education or whatever, have dinner with somebody else. It, 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 since your imagination and your experience is pretty much all you got, you've got to spend your days expanding your experience and your imagination. Uh, John Frank Levy is a four-time Emmy award-winning casting director. Four times. He has cast such iconic television shows as China Beach, yeah, yeah. ER, yeah. The West Wing, Animal Kingdom, yeah. <laughs> Southland, yeah. uh, Shameless. Uh, yeah. There are dozens and dozens of other TV shows, miniseries, um, video games, feature films. He is a John is a five-time winner of the Casting Society of America's Ardios Award and the recipient of its prestigious Hoyt Bowers Award. That is correct. <laughs> All right. Right for the role. Uh, it's funny because I, in thinking about doing this event, I, I went to Barnes & Noble and I uh, was looking at all the books about acting. And I was kind of blown away that, um, that, first of all, that this wasn't there. And Which Barnes & Noble? Uh, the, one in, the one at the Grove. Oh, because it was in the window at uh, the one in Studio City on Ventura Boulevard for a while. Yeah. They invited me to come in and sign, I think they ordered three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get to my point, which was, I think, Having somebody who has been on the other side of the audition process, somebody who is a casting director, write a book about that process, who has seen how many auditions would you? I, 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 um, <laughs> I need a, a lot of hands and feet. Uh, it, it, it's so many that it's a number I can't even imagine. So imagine that, somebody who has been there, who knows what the experience is, who knows what we as actors, I'm assuming that because we're at SAG that there's a lot of actors here, am I right? What we actually go through, what it feels like to walk into that door, to have to expose yourself, to be vulnerable, to be sexy, to be funny, to be naked, and somebody that... Oh, you were in Shameless. <laughs> <laughs> that has the... Um, so, guys, you gotta go out, you gotta get this book, you gotta read it. Um, I think it is amazing. I think... Another thing that really resonated with me was the fact that you, in writing it, you learned a little bit about yourself. Oh, absolutely. In fact, that turned out to be uh, one of the um, amazing things. And actually, I, I thought about you uh, often while I was writing it because you always were so willing to explore and expose parts of yourself that you probably weren't all that thrilled about in other areas, particularly for Animal Kingdom. Yes. And, and, uh, and that bravery, that honesty, was a hallmark for me. Uh, the woman who I wrote the book with, Trudy Roth, you know, she, she said, well, you know, your stories are great, but we need to get you in the book. And you have to be willing to talk about your life and yourself. And, and we'll f keep it focused on the work, but, uh, but like actors, my work depended on my being willing to bring openly, honestly, vulnerably my actual self. And writing the book and doing the work has been a, a, a journey of self-expression, self-discovery, and growth and change. 
What you're saying is not everybody sets out to be a casting director. Uh, nobody does. <laughs> right? I mean, truly. So you, you grew up in the Bronx. Um, that's unexpected. Don't be Yankee fans. <laughs> um, you, uh, you talk about your childhood in the book. Um, what I'm interested in is, you know, we all have an inciting incident, that moment where I can remember vividly what mine was when I was, and it's kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to tell it. Great. I went to, my parents took me to Atlantic City. I was a teen, you know, young, not even a teenager. I was probably 10 or 11. And Sha Na Na was on stage. <laughs> I, I, I looked at my mom and I said, I want to do that. <laughs> you know? So that, for, like, that was it for me, right? Which is crazy. Like, when you think about it, it's crazy. Because I don't know Sha Na Na. Well, it, here's a funny Sha Na Na tie-in. <laughs> I uh, uh, tore my rotator cuff and, and my labrum in my shoulder while we were doing ER. Uh, or it, it revealed itself. And my surgeon was one of the singers in Sha Na Na. Right. He was at Columbia when they formed that ridiculous group. Yeah. So we're, we're both Sha Na Na heads. There you go, man. <laughs> so for you, as what was, I mean, I can, for me, I grew up in, in Maryland and Frederick is like a small town. I, it's hard for me to like connect the dots from there to Hollywood. I can't even, like even I pinched myself that I'm so lucky to do it. But for you in the Bronx, I mean, it's not, it's not, crazy to, to think that no and, and I had a very sophisticated and complex and wonderful uh, mother who uh, put me in a in Brooks Brothers sweaters and took me to see plays in New York some of which were big musicals and some of which were you know uh, acceptable but she also took me to off-Broadway plays that I had no effing idea what they were about or what, what I was supposed to think or feel and I was 10 or 11 and 12 and 13, and I think boys particularly have no idea who they are at 10 through 15 and probably all the way to whatever age we are today. Uh, but but I, I remember sitting in a, in, in a small theater in the West Village of Manhattan with my mom watching uh, something I'm not 100% sure which play I had this reaction to, but I, I suddenly felt that um, this was a room that had power for me. Um, the lights came out and then the lights came up on the stage and there was a person there talking and revealing and being honest and straightforward and I thought, I want to do that, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, um, in high school, you, uh, there was some event occurring that you didn't want to, to be involved in, I, I, something, you know, buttoned up, and this was the 60s, right? Um, so there was an audition for a play, and you, uh, you might have been following a girl to an audition. I, 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 I was. And so this is exactly how I got into the theater, too. I was, I, there, I, you know, there weren't a lot of dudes auditioning for plays, no. and so, you know, I was like the seventh or eighth best basketball player, so that meant I was riding the bench. And but when you went to audition for the plays, there was only like two other guys, so I could do the math and think I can succeed here, right? <laughs> like I have a good chance. You know, there's seven parts, yeah. and I'm gonna be one of them. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I I didn't do it in the book, but I often when I first started talking to groups of young actors or teaching, uh, I. I kind of told the story, there was this girl is the beginning of each paragraph. <laughs> and uh, th th this, actually I was supposed to have lunch with this girl last week, but she, her husband came with her so she didn't show up. I don't know <laughs> what she had in mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> she, she was 50 years too late. <laughs> but, um, but I did audition and we were gonna do um, uh, Camino Real, I think that's how you say it. It's a Tennessee Williams play. And um, I, I got the lead. She didn't get a part at all. <laughs> so I didn't get what I was after. Right. <laughs> but just sort of billiards instead of straight pool. But, but in, a, in a weird way, you didn't get what you were after, but yes, you really did. Huh? I really, I really did. But then uh, the, the headmaster of this private school that I was at, uh, came to watch us rehearse one day and realized what the play was about and said, 
you can't do that play. <laughs> You're 16 years old or yeah. 17 years old. So we, we switched to uh, uh, Tiger at the Gates and I, I got the lead in that one too. And so was that it for you? You were like this determined that well, it, I, I think I, I, when I got to the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York and in, this, uh, in the summer for an orientation before my freshman year, uh, uh, there was this girl. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this and, is and a pattern for you. Her, her, name, her name actually was Betsy Swift and I couldn't, you, if you wrote it in a screenplay, yeah. the network would say that's too obvious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, she asked me uh, what I was going to study or what, what my major was going to be or whatever. And I said, well, I, I'm going to act. I, <laughs> and then I went to an acting, extracurricular acting meeting so in case she was going to be there. Yeah. She wasn't. She wasn't. Um, and, uh, and, and then I, I, I continued to fall in love with it. Quickly, I became a director and not an actor. Right. Um, I, I had a better overview than I had an instinct for, uh, at that time in my life, for doing the work that, that you're so uh, adept at, of being willing to, to reveal. So your Rochester days was filled with, you know, doing, you know, productions of various different things and yeah. at a really exciting time creatively yeah. in the 60s with, you know, yeah, the, the Living Theater was a thing in New York City, yeah. and they came up to the University of Rochester, and uh, I, I was introduced, actually on stage, to their artistic director. I've forgotten his Judith name. Judith Molina and... Uh, uh, no, it was him. Beck. Yeah, Judith. exactly. And he said, while this performance is going on, you and I are going to sit over here and talk about it, because it's Living Theater. And uh, they took a picture of us, and it was in the newspaper the next day. The next time my picture was in the universe, uh, was in the Rochester n paper. It was for a marijuana bust, but that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of that in this book too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it was a very exciting time to to be. And all my friends kept going on strike for anti-war and you know student power and all sorts of other th things and I, I had to sneak away from demonstrations because I had to cross picket lines to go to rehearsal. Right. So. But what an exciting time to you know to sort of spread your creative yeah. wings. And in a you know Rochester New York was at one time a town where Broadway shows came through sure. uh, uh, but but in those days we were off the beaten track so there was all that freedom yeah. and bravery and, you know. Those early days, I mean, even for me, I did a lot of theater in high school um, and I was just so attracted to it. Yeah. You're, you're building something with a, with a team uh, and you're, you know, it's like when I first started the theater, I looked at all these misfits around me who I probably, you know, would never have, communicated with but right. then once you get in that room and you, you you get a piece of paper that says you get to build this and create this dialect and all of a sudden you're you're building something together yeah. and at the end of it you have something to show you've done something and then it you know you might go get high after you definitely got high afterwards <laughs> and then you, you do Not it all tonight. again and so <laughs> but so it's it's you know this is um you know this is a but, theme but you know you. Sean you, 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 you've hit immediately on the two things that the book is actually about and one is self-discovery and the other is community and collaboration and and the, you know the title of the book is right for the role obviously that's a sort of casting acting pun, uh, because every actor thinks they're right for every role, which, by the way, you're right for some and right. less right for others. But I found the role that I was right for, and I didn't even know what a casting director was until I was 30, when I got to the Mark Taper Forum here in Los Angeles. Hey. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't, I never heard of the job, and it became my life. So you, from Rochester, you, there are things happening in your life. You got married, you, you ended up choosing LA. I think you still thought you might be a person in front of the camera at that time, but you know, sort of non, haven't committed either way, right? Right. You ended up, <laughs> this, this one I love, you ended up working for breakdown services. That's correct. In the 70s, when it was a 
kind of a new thing, right? Well, it had been around a little while, but yeah, actually I directed a play uh, in Los Angeles called The Night of the 20th, which was sort of about uh, a group of, uh, of Eastern European uh, kind of like hippies who were avo uh, avoiding their parents' rule and went to what became Israel and formed one of the early kibbutz. And one of the actors in it was the computer guy at Breakdown Services. Uh, uh, and, and he asked me to come and work for them a as a result of that play. And I met casting directors. That way. That way. That's got to be, I mean, the, the early breakdowns just must have, uh, you, you have to have, is there a one good story from? Oh, the, uh, <laughs> a hundred. Uh, uh, Gary Marsh, who runs Breakdown Services, who's been a friend of mine for many years as a result of my working there, he, he's incredibly protective of the copyright of, of Breakdown Services, mm -hmm. of the actual breakdowns. And there were actor collectives in the 70s that somehow illegally got the breakdowns so that they could lean on their agents and managers to submit them or submit them themselves. And uh, we would go out late at night where these actor collectives were meeting and shine flashlights in their faces, <laughs> say, you have the breakdowns illegally. And they would run and That's hide. amazing. <laughs> All right, so you're, you're you're working at Breakdown Services. You you end up back into the in the the world of theater with at the Mark Daper right. Forum. Um, you're at this point you're working as an AD from time to time. No, it, 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 um, I, I was supposed to get the National Endowment for the Arts Directors Fellowship, but the woman who wrote the grants for the taper for the music center missed the deadline. So I, I, I didn't get it. If I was uh, Representative Santos, I would still say I had the NEA <laughs> Director's Fellowship, but I, I didn't. Um, but so Gordon Davidson, who ran the taper in those days, uh, felt so terrible about ha her having missed the deadline that he gave me a, he found a, a quarter in, his <laughs> in the couch at his home and offered me a 25 cent fellowship. Uh, and I, I was at the taper for a couple, couple of years, uh, working as an assistant to the director. Not not like not like, not like in television, but uh, I got a chance to work with Jose Quintero on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and with Kirstie Alley as Maggie, um, and she was great. Uh, I, I got a chance to work with the artistic director of the Negro Ensemble Company on a play called The Soldier's Play, which became. Soldier story, and a young man named Denzel something was in it, um, and and uh, I, I worked with the British nut, brilliant nut uh, Stephen Burkoff on a production of uh, Metamorphosis, Ka Kafka's Metamorphosis that Brad Davis was the star of, and uh, uh, you know it was just an incredible experience, and and I also got to direct. A readings of new plays during that period when I worked with a casting director and a dramaturg and a playwright and however many actors were needed and so we did you know those maybe 20 of those in the time that I was there. So and you're working closely with directors um, who are communicating with actors, you're working with writers who are communicating with directors so you're sort of whether you knew it or not you're you're building, you're filling your toolbox Absolutely. with the, with the Learning things. the languages that everybody speaks that then served me so well dealing with, with writers and directors and actors and producers and budgets and all of it. Yeah. And so then you, you, you directed a perf some production at the Cornet. Is yeah. that what it was? <laughs> and yeah. you got... Bad reviews. You got bad reviews. Uh, I, I hadn't had a, a lot of failure at that point in my life. And as we were talking in the, uh, in, in the green room, which isn't green, um, you know. They never are. A, a failure is, uh, in s I mean, obviously, I, I enjoyed the list of successes. But there's an equally long list of failures, and 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 uh, failure is such an amazing teacher, uh, and and it's also such a <laughs> constant part of an actor's life that you have to turn it into an opportunity yeah. to learn and grow and change. Um, otherwise, it will 
beat the living hell out of you. Yeah, um, you know, people will ask me, even my son who's 16 is talking about this business and, you know, as somebody who's been through it and, you know, I've had success, I've had TV shows, I've been in movies and theater, all of it, and it still breaks my heart almost every day. And you have to be um, okay with that. Yeah. It, 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 you have to not only be okay, I mean, I think you have to find a way to make it into food yes. so, so that you can triumph over it, so you can see it as an opportunity and, and, and not, I mean, it, it, it's, it's brutal. And, you know, as many actors as I've hired and uh, as many people have, I've brought joy to, it's probably tenfold the number whose hearts I've broken. And, yeah. and uh, uh, I had to figure out a way to make that feel okay, too. Yeah. And as luck would have it, right around the time that you got this bad review, somebody presented an opportunity exactly and asked you to come work at a casting office which I'm not sure if you had ever even considered up until that point no I hadn't I hadn't considered it at all but you, your life was happening and you know you had a child I, I, I was just about to have two right <laughs> so sometimes you know you don't get to make the decision it's sort of made for you yeah and this was one of those times and, and I mean I, I, I talk about that a little bit in the book and, and being receptive and open to the happy accident with a girl or in your life or in a career mm -hmm. is, is uh, those are all uh, it's a it's a kind of a skill to develop the, the idea of being open to huh mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that and that seems like it might be f worth trying mm -hmm. and then it turns into a life Sometimes. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Now, now we're into now we're in the casting years, right? You're a you're a casting director in the early '80s. Was there anything? You know, you have fresh eyes looking at this for the very first time in the process of bringing actors in. Um, was there anything? That surprised the hell out of you in those early oh, days? Oh, almost everything. I mean, for one thing, I think the very first thing I did, I was working as an associate to, to a woman named Barbara Clayman, who was a, a legend in New York and then came out here and started BCI, Barbara Clayman Incorporated, I guess. And she, she was a very tough and interesting woman. And the first thing she asked me to do was uh, work on a, a Budweiser beer commercial for a July 4th campaign on television. But, um, but then later, <laughs> there was a, a, a small film with a Hungarian director whose name I can't remember, Peter Medak, just came to me. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and it was about, there were seven actors uh, of, of this sort of the same generation who were buddies who had written this film together. And it was their weekend at a prostitution facility. And uh, one of the women, um, her specialty was she would whisper not so sweet nothings <laughs> in your ear. That was her thing. And uh, there was this one gal who. So you're reading with the. I'm reading with these. The, I'm reading the men who are already hired. Right. And this woman gets up, and it's before, you know, we're not videotaping the, or, you know, uploading or, you know, so. She comes over to where I'm sitting and she whispers not so sweet nothings into my ear. And I, uh, the director called me the thermometer from then on. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. All right, well, on this note, I, I want to say um, John and I, because we're going to get to ER, um, but while, while we're, because this is a perfect setup for, so John and I, when you were casting ER, you brought me in, actually, I was offered a role on ER, and I didn't do it, because at the time I was sort of doing movies, it was, it was a part of an, a, a veteran who, whatever, um, and I, it, it didn't work for me, so I, I ended up passing. But then, a year later, you guys came back to me 
and my agent presented this other opportunity, but they wanted me to audition. And I was like, but they offered me that other one. Like, I don't want to audition for this. Well, you said no, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so my, my manager smartly said, you're going to want to look at this because it was this great role. The character had multiple personalities and John Wells was directing it. So I, uh, I wisely, you know, agreed to come in and whatever. It, it was a good audition. John cast me in that. If it weren't for that, I wouldn't have the career that I have because then Southland came along, which I ended up being a part of, and then Animal Kingdom, and et cetera, et cetera. Having said all that, John, because I've now been uh, privileged to uh, experience many table readings with, with this guy, and he is, uh, not only is he a great reader when you come in to audition, but when we do these table readings, there's 12 roles that, that we haven't cast yet or that, that couldn't make the reading. So, so John will play prostitute number one. He'll play cop number four. He'll play Smurf if she's not there. And he is a fantastic actor. He just has... Uh, well, as soon as it didn't matter, I got really good. <laughs> um, and but, you know, Sean is the only actor, if he was a baseball player, he'd be incredibly rich because he's the only actor who's batting a thousand in my office. He's auditioned, well, two and then the third time we went back to offering. Uh, but uh, thanks, I appreciate <laughs> well, that. thank you. And, you know, on the way, on the, uh, on the very last Animal Kingdom table reading that our Smurf attended, uh, and where people said goodbye to her, she walked over to me and said, I've enjoyed acting with you. <laughs> Which I don't think she said to anybody no, else. No, but I never heard that, no way. <laughs> uh, quite the opposite, actually. No. Um, uh, so, but back to your, um, so the, you know, and, and look, we're gonna get, you, you know, you started off as an associate, but you worked your way up. Um, soon, soon, you soon found China Beach on your desk? Yeah, I was. I, I, I went from Barbara Clayman to Marsha Kleinman, uh, uh, and then Phyllis Huffman uh, hired me at Warner Brothers. And I did a, a pilot, which actually is kind of extraordinary because um, Tim Matheson was the executive producer and the star, and the leading lady uh, in the pilot was Annette Benning. And I hope Tim isn't here. I, I'm sure, I, I don't think he would be. But Tim wasn't funny and it was a comedy. <laughs> and so we had to fire Annette. So I, I have not only had the glory of casting Sean Hattesey, but I've had the uh, responsibility of firing Annette Benning. <laughs> Oof, but then crazy. Phyllis Huffman brought this rather thick two hour manuscript into my office and said, read this, I think you'll like it. And it, and it was China Beach, and I more than liked it. It yeah. was fabulous. It was, uh, you know, it was about the women who were in Vietnam. There were these girls. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was about the women in Vietnam more than it was about the soldiers or the war. And um, uh, uh, it, it was just so well written. Sadly, we lost John Sacred Young this year. He had a brain tumor and left us a... Not that early, but early enough. <laughs> and Bill Broyles, who was a decorated Vietnam hero and a wonderful writer who's gone on to write a lot of fabulous stuff in the feature world. Uh, um, and Rod Holcomb, who I worked with again on ER, the pilot, and um, was the director. And it was an extraordinary experience. Yeah, we have um, Dana Delaney, Mark Helgenberger. Uh, I mean, they're perfect. <laughs> they, they really are, and they're so talented. And it sent this. This sent them on a rocket ship. Yeah. Um, oh, and I want to just go back and say the fact that you did that ER episode and that that led to Southland and that that led to Animal Kingdom and that, but I don't believe for one minute that that was the only road that was going to be available to someone of your commitment and talent. I, I appreciate that. Um, but what I, I mean. We'll get to Wells, but the fact that, you know, being in that world, um, he's a loyal guy who does amazing work. It just, for me, like I had been bouncing around and doing 
things and movies and I didn't feel like I, working with John, I feel like I have a place. Yeah, right? it's a community. It, it's a community and it feels like, um, it's sort of like when you talk about in your book the auditioning process and how there's a line full of actors out in the hallway and you like to go out there and greet them so that they have a human experience before you walk into that room. Like I've been the recipient of that and I can't tell you how appreciative because yeah. when I got into the room, you created this environment that felt like I could do the things that we talked about, you know, expose myself, be vulnerable, all these things. You know, when you're an actor and you are tight, you can't release your, you know, the, no. the inhibitions are, are, you know, blocking you. Yeah. I've, in those rooms, I felt so free. Um, so having that with you and having that with John, like, you know, that's what I mean. That, that I, gave I, me the career. I that, appreciate that. And, yeah. and, and again, that's the, um, you know, the, the, that's where, where I was able, as I found myself right for a role, I was able to see what you all needed. And it wasn't because I was the nicest guy in the history of the planet Earth. I wanted to go home and have dinner with my friends, yeah. you know, my family or be with my children. Uh, uh, and I didn't want to be in the office uh, setting up tomorrow because today was a failure. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but I also, I really wanted, I understood organically that you needed to feel welcomed, comfortable, in order for you to do your best work. And I, want, I was committed to the project and committed to you. Yeah, well, thank you, because it-, it Y'all. Y'all, yeah, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I was just curious, because it crossed my mind, and maybe you don't remember, because you've seen so many auditions, but between Dana and Marg, um, you know, I just wonder, you know, what makes an actor stand out and particularly with these two, um, were there qualities that they had in those those auditions? Um, was it better in the first read and worse when they got in front of producers? Well, you know, I think one of the most interesting things about China Beach is that Dana is actually more like the character KC in her personal life, and Marg is more like the character that Dana played, McMurphy in her real life, and yet they were able to, um, if, you know, I mean, I always said about Dana that the thing about her that uh, was made her right for, for, for Colleen McMurphy was that if you were a 19-year-old boy 10,000 miles away from home with a gunshot wound, her arms would be where you would like to die. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was just something so mm -hmm. that about her. Um, and I think she was a little bit of a wild child in, in her personal life, but McMurphy wasn't. She was a place to rest and to find love and comfort. Marg, I mean, you remember, I mean, I don't know if any of you remember the, sh the opening of, of China Beach, but uh, on, it starts on Marg's boots and climbs slowly up her body to her beautiful red-headed face uh, and she's got a cigarette in one hand and her left arm is up on the door frame and uh, um, you would buy anything from her right. and <laughs> overpay yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and and that's what was right for them and I don't remember um, you know they both had to test yeah. and uh, uh, eventually, Dana screen tested. Uh, uh, Helen Hunt was the other person who screen test opposite of her. The network wasn't, um, they were divided. <coughs> and it was a lengthy conversation. And I can't imagine, I mean, Helen is a wonderful actress. She went on to be an Academy Award winner, I think. Um, but that was Dana's part. Yeah. yeah. You talk about in the book a little bit about how when Back in those days, there wasn't as much oversight yeah. that nowadays it's, there's so many voices and everything is taped 
and you know everybody has an opinion every 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 decision yeah. is made by a well there's some forum. junior casting director who makes hundred thousand dollars a year at the network who is approving every decision part yeah. I mean down to yeah I mean I, I, literally we were doing a pilot uh, uh, at, at Fox years ago and uh, there was a one-line paramedic uh, and that person was going to be on camera for about that long because it was about the series regular and the, the junior casting executive said he's not approved and I, I was like you know I don't mean to be rude or unpleasant although I feel like being rude and unpleasant <laughs> I have ca personally cast more one line <laughs> EMTs than everybody else on the planet earth <laughs> so you know your opinion it, it doesn't really hold much sway with me and, and that pilot is very famous for the network uh, uh, repeatedly rejecting a young British actress uh, who they eventually caved on and approved and never liked who is a young woman you may have heard of called Florence Pugh yeah. uh, and that pilot was killed because they never liked her right. and we sort of shoved the, her down their throat was there ever, uh, we'll get, we're, we're kind of building to your meeting with John, but um, John Wells, but was there, just in you saying that, was there ever a casting choice that you knew was the home run that for some reason, you know, got killed by an executive? Well, I, I, I would say, you know, probably there are, although I don't remember them, but I, I uh, I, I know you know this, but um, I knew you were a home run for Animal Kingdom. And we had to wait a while because the network thought there were a lot of European bad guys in, in small films that should play Pope that uh, w w w would have been dangerous, but wouldn't have had the other side of the coin that you so brilliantly brought to that impossible part that you played for six years. God. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, 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 you know, and, and uh, I, I, you know, eventually we were able to say to them, trust us, th th this is the right guy, and, and man, did you prove us right. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. I wasn't leading to that, but I'll take it. Um, uh, so, China Beach, the first season, uh, didn't include John Wells, but for some reason he was brought on during the second season. Well, I, well either he was brought on be, after the pilot and before the first season, or maybe after the first season, okay. which was only six episodes. Right, it was a short I think that's season. what happened. And he was brought on to... Run the writer's room under John Sacred Young, who never saw a dollar he didn't want to spend three times. And John had an overall deal as a young writer at John Wells had an overall deal as a young writer at, at Warner Brothers Television, and he was kind of brought on to uh, police, young. Is that what it was? And you, were you nominated for the first season of China Beach as for, for an Emmy? No, there no. weren't any Emmys for casting until oh, okay. the first one I won was the very first one that was awarded. Which was? ER. Oh, it was. And NYPD Blue, we shared it. Got it. All right, sorry. Sorry, sorry. You've got so many, I just didn't remember like which one. But anyway, so, so you start working with John and um, you're starting to build this, that, remember that thing we talked about in, in, in college where you've got like your misfits all working together? Yeah. This is happening now, but now you're working with like Mark Helgenberger and Dana Delaney and, and John, you're like the most talented people on the planet, but you're doing what you sort of were doing in college, right? Yeah, well I was doing what I was doing and what I was unconsciously doing, which was finding the role I was right for. Right. And finding my own journey and my own self. And finding my way to contribute to excellence and to meet excellence with excellence. And, and boy was that a heady ex experience. And, but you know, I think just to back up just briefly, Wells and I didn't hit it off right away. Right. He sort of thought I, I don't know exactly what he thought, but we, we bounced a little bit at the very first. I was 
John Sacred Young and Bill Broyles and Rod Holcomb's guy because of the pilot being in the mud with them during the pilot. So when Wells came on, he was establishing himself with people that were already in the community. Sure. Um, but we, but we, but we found each other partly because of our theater history. You know, he went to Carnegie Mellon and was a stage manager and a director uh, there, and and I had come from similar background. Did his touch was it felt on in in the new season? Was yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Because the greatest thing about working for John is his system that he's got this organizational approach, so that nobody. You're almost never wasting your time. You're spending your time productively. And uh, he instituted that in the writer's room of China Beach so that there was a way that they got to the stories and the arcs and he, he led the other writers. And many of those writers, Carol Flint, Lydia Woodward, became part of ER, became part of other shows that we did together so that it really was a, a, a forming community. Okay, well now I'm going to refer to my notes, but we're going we're gonna to say that that lasted for four years? I, I think we, it was four seasons without short order and, and three more significant orders. I think we did something under 70 episodes and more than 65. Wow. The next big project in your life was a show called ER. Yeah. And John, um, ha is, has he asked you to work for his company at this point, or are you no, still No, I'm, I'm an executive at Warner Brothers, and in fact, the merger happened oh, between right. Warner Brothers and Lorimar. Uh, I called it Warner Mar from then on. Uh, but the old Warner Brothers, which was a small television outfit, hard to believe, was absorbed by Lorimar, and only three or four of the people from the old Warner Brothers came over to, uh, to, to Lorimar, and uh, uh, John advocated for my being included in that group of executives with um, the now disgraced Les Moonves, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, who agreed, and uh, apparently I irreverently said to a Warner Brothers executive, oh, I'm going from quality to quantity, and that was reported to Moonves, who um, teased me about it the first time we met. <laughs> so ER, you get this script. Yeah. And what was different about it than, than other scripts? Well, the, the, first, the, th th the first thing that was unbelievable was that nobody had names. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, there would be a scene, it would say, nurse, doctor, nurse, nurse, doctor. And I, I, I you know, called John and I was like, is the nurse on page two the same as the one on page 46? Or, you know, how, what the hell? And so he addressed that for us. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it was before electronic submissions. It was before, and we didn't, and it got picked up kind of late. So we didn't really have um, time to do a full breakdown and sorting of them. So Kevin Scott, who's gone on to do a wonderful job casting on his own, was my uh, assistant at the time. And uh, we literally took, we went through all of our pictures and resume files, which no one keeps anymore, I guess. Uh, and we just identified all of the actors we loved. And I sat in the middle of the floor of my office and surrounded myself with 40 pictures. And Kevin stood in the doorway and said, this, there's a 45-year-old female African-American nurse. And I went <laughs> and handed them, he clipped them together and set them up for appointments. And we did that and then we would replace the empty slots of the pictures. I guess we were creating our own uh, mainframe. Yeah. <laughs> in a weird way. But, but we were, and as you alluded to earlier, in those days, you know, it was before cell phones, we didn't even have a fax machine. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the autonomy was integral to the, the stuff that we were working with. Um, and we just, uh, you know, we, we, we cast all of those characters that were under the leads, uh, who became so important to, to the, I call them the trampoline, uh, because they made it possible for the leads to jump higher. Yeah. 
But I, I remember a funny day, uh, John was upstairs talking about budget with the production office. And he came into the office and he's, you know, how's it going kind of thing. And I was like, <laughs> and there was a pile of pictures for uh, a Dr. Green. And it just happened that Anthony Edwards' picture was on the top of the pile. It wasn't, uh, I, it wasn't being, it wasn't me, but, uh, and John said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, you know, uh, uh, he had become a, a character man after having been Goose in the original Top Gun, and, but he still had all of that charm and stuff, but he also had that, uh, the quality that we were looking for on ER, which was heroism. Mm -hmm. Everybody, whether they were flawed or whatever else they had, they needed to be selfless mm -hmm. and heroic. And Anthony certainly w was, was that and went on to, I remember uh, early on in the pilot of, of, of ER, I was sitting in Barbara Miller's office and we were watching dailies. And I think I tell that story in the book. Um, and, and we're watching Anthony uh, in, a, in a scene and she calls out to her assistant Richard and says, hey Richard, cancel my doctor's appointment for next week. I'm going to Dr. Green. <laughs> <laughs> and I think America felt that way. Yeah. I'm going to read a little thing from your book here, <clears throat> which landed with me. Um, I know what you are when I'm sitting in a room with you. I get you and I see a sense of where to put you. From my summers as a boy in, in Martha's Vineyard making mobiles out of driftwood and shells, I understand aesthetic balance. When you've got a fiery, passionate, wild child, George Clooney in one corner, you have to balance him out with a level-headed, pragmatic Anthony Edwards in the other. My bottom line advice to actors, aspiring casting directors, and everyone in between is simply this. Keep figuring out who you are so you can be yourself with honesty and delight, humor and absurdity. It, it happens to be my favorite sentence in the book. <laughs> I think that's like so amazing. Um, and that's the environment you create. It's a challenge for actors because sometimes you'll get a, an audition that just isn't you. You know, you look at uh, a breakdown of this character who, you know, who, who just doesn't feel like it's you at, at, as your core, but you're an actor. You know, Pope isn't me. God, no. And, the, the executives didn't, at, at TNT, didn't see it. Um, so it's a fine line, but what you say there, you be yourself. And I'm trying to get to what that really means. Well, um, I, because sometimes we have to take big risks as actors, yeah. and it isn't us. Um, but it still has to feel rooted, grounded, authentic, real, and committed. Um, so, you know, I, this is just a bigger conversation because I know we're a room full of actors and we're trying to figure out how to make the best self-tape right now because that's the way we do it, you know? Yeah. I've been fortunate enough to have a, a, a little bit of a social interaction with, with Sean and his wonderful wife and my longtime partner. There still is this girl. <laughs> and uh, she had not known Sean at all. And when we first met at a Wells Christmas party or a kickoff party or whatever it was, she said, look, are, are you going to go over and say hello to, 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 to Sean and Kelly? And I was like, yeah. And she said, well, he's not Pope, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, really. You, you. But, but the thing about that sentence and about uh, acting it is that you were able to find not in your experience, but in your imagination and in your voyage of self-discovery, a piece of something that was a touchstone that let you be authentically Pope. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, you weren't, it, 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 when I say find out who you are so that you can <coughs> be yourself, uh, part of that, you know, I mean, you have your experiences, you have your training, you have your body and you have your voice, and you have your imagination. A lot of acting is what-ifing yourself. 
yourself into the circumstances and emotional state and experience of the character. And, and um, you don't have to, you know, um, there's this whole this conversation about authenticity that goes on in today's uh, politically correct environment where, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Carrie Weaver, Laura Innes, wouldn't be allowed to play that part today because she doesn't walk with a cane and a, a disabled actor would be wildly preferred. And I, I have no objection to that, but on the same, by the same token, you don't have to go kill somebody to play a murderer. Yeah. I, I, and I hope you won't. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, well, I, I, while we're on the subject, because I, I think it's exciting to talk about, you know, auditioning and, and finding, um, finding the balance, you know, our business has, you know, you and I <laughs> have been doing this a while and we've spent, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room, we've spent, you know, hours perfecting how to, to, to audition, you know, and um, auditioning is not the same thing as being on set, you know, auditioning is getting the part, is giving them a, a taste. It's certainly not perfect because it's always growing, it's getting better. My performance in season one as Pope is vastly different than where it came to in season uh, and six. It, and it ought to be and it has to be. So, you know, we've spent this time figuring out how to go into a room, how to calm our nerves, how to breathe, how to, how to knock it out of the park with one chance. And you've spent a lifetime figuring out how to make that a comfortable environment for actors, and now we don't do that anymore. Uh. Yeah. <coughs> so, I mean, I, you know, just to talk about the self-tape a yeah. little bit, and well, uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it, it, as all, as the pro it's the byproduct of all technology is convenience, uh, it, it's maximizing, you know, you, you don't have to spend two hours in your car trying to find a parking place and hoping you get there on time. And all, all, there's so many things about it which are great. You, you, the director is in Vancouver in a hotel room, he can watch the self-tapes. Uh, all of that is so, uh, I can see 30 people in half the time that I used to see five people. Mm -hmm. All of that is great. Uh, but for me, because I'm an OG, uh, uh, I miss you. I miss seeing you in the waiting room with your earphones on, panicking because you're not confident that today's the right day or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you, your car screwed you up and you got there 10 minutes late and I kept you waiting 15 so it turned out okay but you know whatever happened mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to contribute there and I, I miss introducing you to my colleagues and friends and I'm and I learned so much in those days about your talent and your artistry and yourself outside of the work mm -hmm. and that doesn't exist anymore and so, you know, other than the work, you have the slate where you can reveal a little bit about yourself, maybe, but if you try too hard in the slate to be cute or to be funny or to be sexy or to be smart or to be whatever you think you're supposed to be projecting, that's a terrible idea. You know, it's like, it reminds me of the nine-year-olds who came in and their mother said, told them to do a magic trick before they started the scene. You know, I wanted to go out and kill their mothers in the, ha in the hallway. Um, but, it, so now, now it's just the work. And it's not even a real um, honest representation of the work because who knows whether it's take two or seven or 12 or 43. It's 43 for me. <laughs> and, and that's unusual because I don't, I don't think most people get better after take three. I think most people... No, you, it's like one and two are great and then, you know, three, three through eight. Three through eight <laughs> 18 are really bad, but 19 is pretty good. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, I... I, I um, it's the same, you know, like people used to say, is it different to act on stage and to act on television or film? And the answer was always, 
Yes and no. You know, I mean, yeah, you don't have to do project to the fourth balcony, but, but uh, and you know, in, in film and television, the camera and the microphone will find you. You don't have to show anybody anything. Yeah. The less you do, the better in some ways. I, you know, I, I, I directed four episodes of Animal Kingdom, so I, and so two of them were pre-pandemic. Right. So I was... In my room. Luck, lucky enough to be in the room again, but this time I got to make some decisions. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so what you get in the room, and we generally, you would bring us six, six, you know. Five, six for the, for the co-stars yeah. and the one-off guest, you know, one-day guest stars. And then if there were arcs and bigger parts, we would show you more. And for the, you know, for the most part, you know, there would be nerves in the live performances, of course. I mean, understandably. Um, but what you get in the live performance that you can never, what, what, what I never got when we, after the pandemic, when it was tapes, is I would see, you, you, you tell a great story in your book about an actress who does this with her hands <laughs> beforehand, and then she's that like, That was on Wait. China Beach. And then so you asked uh, Rod afterwards, what did he think? And he was like, he did this, and he was like, he didn't have to say anything else. You knew what you were gonna be experiencing yeah. on set. You get the personality, yeah. and that just wasn't you know, in the cards. Um, so when, when you're, also if there's a note or an adjustment, you see how a, an actor takes it, it's great. I mean, to do yeah. it live is just wonderful. You don't get that. But now having said that, the other side of it as a director, getting the tapes, like you said, not only is it convenient, but I mean, you would deliver me six great performances and it would, they were all home runs. You know. Well, thank you. The, and, and you know, ultimately, when you're a guest player on a television show, your job is to feed the people who our audience is coming back to see every week. Uh, and, and for me, a good casting session is when the director says, you know, if it's her, then that's what it looks like from his point of view or what, or what light it shines on our series regular. But if it's her, it shines a different light, and that light is more interesting to me. And, so, and sometimes directors come in, you know, and, and the good ones come in with pre preparation, as good actors come in with preparation. And then you also have to be willing to get off your preparation and go, happy accident, I didn't think of that. She is more interesting than what I had thought of, mm -hmm. and let's do that instead. Yes, and I always found, in my experience with you, you know, if there was cop number two who had two lines, that you, I don't know if you intentionally do it or not, but I, to me it always felt like you would present people who had a, a backstory. <laughs> you know, even in those two lines, cop number two, maybe he was hung over. And so it sort of brought something to it that maybe I didn't expect, but as a director, you want great, real, authentic performances out of everything. Yeah. So it just makes it all. You know, it's that one of the reasons better. why shows that shoot in the old days, shows that shot in Vancouver, had a hole in them because often the acting pool wasn't deep enough, and you had to cast somebody local, and they they couldn't hold up their end, and so you know you invited the audience to press the clicker and see what was on CBS. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I also wanted to talk about is, <laughs> this landed with me, you talk about um, when Dr. Green died on ER, it was as you know sad and emotionally um, terrible as when it's people in your real life. Yeah, well you know, away. you, you, you uh, Wells is always saying to us, you know, uh, you've got to be a respectful, collaborative part of this community because you spend more time here than you do with your family. Yeah. And th that may be, uh, uh, I mean, that, whether that's right, good or bad or right or wrong, who knows. But, um, but it's true, and you, if you have a run like ER, we, we lived with, Anthony Edwards as Mark Green, he was a part of our lives. And, and uh, 
and it wasn't just the deaths. I mean, when people went through things, when, you know, Maura Tierney, who's one of my favorite actresses, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, when her character went through the stuff with Sally Field or Crazy Mother, and uh, I mean, um, I adored my mother, but she was kind of crazy. I, uh, I was able to extrapolate uh, and uh, identify with her experience with a crazy mother. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's true. It, it becomes so much a part of the fabric of your daily life. And also because in those days, I read men, women, patients, doctors, children. I read it with everybody. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so I was, and because I tried to be as real as I could be to feed the actors who were auditioning, I actually experienced a lot of those scenes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it, that made so much sense to me just as somebody who's been on a show and had to go through that um, because it's, you are creating this thing and you're dedicating your life to make it, to making it a, living, breathing thing. So right. to you it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so when it dies, <laughs> you know, a little part of you dies. Yeah, it absolutely. I mean, I crazy. would imagine on some level that, that, that uh, letting Pope go was probably a pleasure, an exhalation uh, of sorts. But that at the same time, it, it had become a gigantic part of, of your life. Something happens um, when you play something for so long that you, people would always ask me when I was directing how, how it must have been such a challenge for you to, you know, play Pope and then direct at the same time. So playing Pope is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> like, we do two takes of this show. It's become such a yeah. natural thing that, um, yeah. that when the script, you know, when the writing is good, yes. you know, and it is, um, and there are emotional things that are happening that are pulling this thing that you're so connected to, there's no acting involved. You know, yeah. when, when he's going through those things and it's emotional, I'm not trying, it's just happening, which yeah. is, you know, such a pleasure to be uh, a part of. And, Absolutely. You know, so, all right. Um, I am going to, oh, this was interesting. Um, after my ER, um, which was, I know we talked about, but I played multiple personalities. It was wild. Um, uh, John always did such a great job of calling us, you know, after a show would air yeah. or if you directed something. You don't, nobody does that, but John Wells, you'll yeah. get the call from the... He used John. to send flowers to the person who didn't get the part. Is that right? And when they tested. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. I got a call from my agent after, uh, after the ER aired and they said you're not going to believe this but Steven Spielberg watched last night's ER and <laughs> the, his office called and I was like this is it guys I, I am going straight to the moon like, <laughs> like, like, this, it's, it's happening um, anyways it didn't happen um, they, they brought he, he, he was doing at the time uh, the Paci it was the Band of Brothers, but in the Pacific. Oh. So they brought me in, and I didn't get a part. But he w he wasn't even part of the process. It was somebody else that they put me with. But anyways, I just thought that was a fun thing to share with a bunch of actors. <laughs> was that like that th I was I was I was happening, man. Saving Private Ryan Part Two coming my way, right? <laughs> nope, didn't happen. Um, anyways, uh, I know that there are a lot of. Uh, other shows that you went on to cast, West Wing, um, and uh, Shameless, which were wonderful, wonderful shows. And I, I loved doing Shameless after a hundred years of doing network television. You go, we can say that? <laughs> we, holy shit, we can do that? Yeah. Um, all right, uh, I can't read this. Yeah, I had trouble reading it too. So this guy should have been a doctor. <laughs> did you did, did you write it? No, it wasn't me. I have another question. Oh, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. I have another question too. So when you watch the self tapes, um, and then you have a callback where there are interesting moments when you see the person live, like in real person, like, oh, they're like different, or that was not. Expensive. Well, you know, in in the in the uh, post or during the pandemic, we didn't have any live auditions. 
uh, none. So I didn't have that experience. But, um, but kind of offshoot of that, we were casting Sean at 16 and his twin sister who died of a heroin off overdose in the pilot at 16 and Scott Speedman's character a little bit older. And, and we did it all on self-tapes, narrowed it down to two people for each part, and then did a Zoom um, mix and match chemistry reading, uh, uh, you know, w with every permutation in three different scenes for each of the different possibilities. And, um, and I was telling Sean in the not green room, the, uh, the director said to me at a certain point, we muted everybody else and we just all looked at each other. We were in the same, no, we were on, we were in different rooms as well. And he, he said, J Jesus, this is weird. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, it, it's pretty hard to assess chemistry and, and, and mix and match stuff the way we used to. Uh, you know, it's, it's like cooking, it's like watching Top Chef because the, you know, you can't smell the food, you can't, uh, but, uh, and yet, we succeeded. We did. Which was um, both incredibly gratifying and a little annoying. <laughs> Because I'm a great proponent of going back to the way things were, and I, I don't think we, we ever will economically or, or practically because we were able, to, you know, it's like no good deed goes unpunished. You succeed at doing something that seems impossible, and, and then it becomes the norm. One of the stories that stayed with me and with many of us is when you shared how you've been very committed to diversity casting, and not just when it comes to like me as a Latina, let's say, but even with disability or ailments, like the AIDS story um, that you mentioned. And so my question to you would be is in today's world where we're seeing diversity really planning up, how do you see that changing for casting even moving forward? Well, you know, I mean, I think the networks are finally being straightforward about, they didn't want to say, I got to have one of this and one of that and two of that and three of those uh, because they didn't want to uh, they didn't want to admit that it was a mandate uh, and then you know then you'd cast a part and a white woman would get the part and then you'd cast a part and the, you know these pilots just have their own energy you know you don't intend to cast this part first or that part last but then you get down to you only have two parts left and you look at the pictures on the wall, and you go, shit, everybody's white, or whatever. And, and then, and then you, you, the network then rejects people who are also white. And if they had said early, and I've always said to writers, identify who you want in this part. If this part wants to be a person of color, say so, and then I'll, I'll fish in that pond, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, um, and so then it has evolved. Um, so th they are now acknowledging that it's a mandate. And, but, and when it was first happening, you see a lot of you know cop shows, and there'd be a handsome black man with a goatee and a shaved head in the fifth lead, and that would be called diversity. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and uh, so we, we have come a long way and it's so important that representation be authentic and real and that people, you know, I was so moved the other night in the Screen Actors Guild Awards when James Hong was celebrated. I've known James since he was my age, which is, <laughs> you know, he's been around, he's in his 90s, I think. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, and I, I cast him years ago, and nobody had to tell me to. And I, uh, the, if you look back at ER, uh, it's true that Eric was the only person of color in the main titles, but the nurses and the EMTs and the desk clerks and the patients uh, uh, were of color because it made sense. Because an ER in a major urban area is the primary care facility for disenfranchised or poor or whatever characterization you want to add to it. Um, and so, it, you know, it made sense that we had all of those people of color and nobody, uh, and because that made sense to John, that made sense to me, uh, I didn't have to be told. And frankly, I think I acknowledge that I'm enough of a brat 
that I don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> and if you tell me to do something, I'm likely to do something else. I mean, I, I'm not anywhere near as bad as Aaron Sorkin, but when the network <laughs> told him that he had to get diverse characters into, uh, into the West Wing, the first diverse character he added was the president's physician who was killed in a helicopter crash. That was his way of saying, madam. <laughs> So, but, but you, you know, uh, John has a project, John Wells has a project right now based on a fantastic novel that I read 10 years ago called The Emperor of Ocean Park. And it's about an a elite black family that vacations on Martha's Vineyard and is a big shot a, a Supreme Court justice or something like that. And uh, I'm not casting it because I'm white. And that's okay. I've had it really good, you know, my grandfather and his grandfather had it really good. There's no complaining from white people that's legitimate. But at the same time, I love that novel, and I have cast men, women, people of color. I, I can, I, my skills transcend that, but that's not the world we live in anymore. And it's, if I only could cast uh, television shows about aging, funny, smart Jewish men. <laughs> I don't know, I, there probably aren't two. <laughs> the Goldbergs was just canceled. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. All right, on that note, look, I, I have here my, um, my SAG card, and uh, can, can, can you read the date on it? Uh, it, it looks like 07. No, it's 1990. Oh, well, I guess... I've had I'm my SAG card since 1990. Wow. Yeah. So... <laughs> That's the... Prior to... Before AFTRA and SAG merged, you could be AFTRA. Right. Yeah. And you... So I, I was a... I was a... Um, in Maryland, of all places, I was an actor who... Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of opportunity there, no. as you can imagine. Washington was yeah, a big... It was like Baltimore and Washington. But I had done, like, a commercial and uh, for Pepsi, but it was like a local thing. But that was after, right? And then I did a couple of other, like a Maryland public television thing, also after. So 1990, I went in for an industrial, um, uh, and I didn't know what that meant. I but still it, don't. It was a film <laughs> that doctors were going to use to to learn how to talk to patients. Uh -huh. So I, I went in for this audition, I improvised, they, they had us improvise. I got the part. It was how I got my SAG card. When I got on set, they said, this is what your scene is going to be. This doc, your teenager, this doctor is gonna to have to tell you that you have gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So anyways, I thought the actors and the audience would have Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, we did that storyline 150 times on, on ER as well. So. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have a question? I think Can you just got delivered oh, one. Oh, shit, it's cursive. Mine was also the question you couldn't read. Oh, well, could you say it? Yeah, of course. Sorry. I, didn't, um, I just wanted to ask about, um, you know, you've worked in so many TV shows that Let's say West Wing, for example, when it, there were so many people clamoring to be on that show from unknowns to very well known. So how did you, how do you cast, I mean, were you saving people for some things? Were you, what were the conversations like about, because you could only bring so many people in? Well, there really weren't a lot of conversations on the West Wing. Uh, it was mostly a monologue, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Aaron is a one-man band. And, I, and, and in fact, I left the show at the end of the second season, uh, just in time to get my second Emmy for it. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, because I'm interested in community and collaboration, I was not interested in continuing to work in that environment. He's brilliant, he's lovely, uh, he's generous, he's a wonderful guy, but he, his creative impulse just didn't speak to me. Um, but, you know, m m m uh, 
certainly you wouldn't use an actor of enormous skill and talent and some name value or a lot of name value in something that didn't merit that kind of a, of a, of a, of a talent. Um, so in that sense, yes, we did save people or you would think about somebody would be submitted and you'd go, um, I, they haven't read the script and this is really only two scenes and it's, uh, it's not likely to come back and so I, even though I love him, no. Um, uh, but, I, um, you know, I mean, I think that uh, that brings me to the, you know, people have asked me recently in a number of different ways whether social media matters to me in, as a casting variable and it doesn't matter to me at all. We don't say anything. That, this is that next question. Because I want them to hear it on camera. There are individuals getting jobs from what they do on social media or the numbers of follower, number of followers. How important is it uh, to casting directors? Well, it may be very important to casting directors under 35 or 40. Um, and that's well and good. I, I have recently gone on Instagram because it's an incredible tool to promote right for the role. And uh, I've, uh, I'm, you know, amazed by what, 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 what I, who I've gotten to interact with as a result of being on Instagram. But, and maybe the publicist on the show that I'm working on cares about how many followers you have. I don't care at all. <laughs> it's hard for newer actors to get in the door without an agent. Um, is it okay for actors to reach out to casting offices directly if they feel like a good fit for a show? Uh, if yes, how would you prefer actors to do that? You, you know, that's another uh, uh, repercussion of technology. I don't have an office anymore. And frankly, I'll be damned if I'm giving out my home phone number <laughs> or, or my cell number or my personal email address. Some of you may have found them. They're not that hard to find. <laughs> But, you know, in the old days, you could drop by and say, hey, how are you? Thanks for the audition last week. Or uh, uh, here's a postcard. I'm going to be appearing on ABC next week in this show. Uh, it's a good part. Or I'm doing a play in town. Or, you know, uh, I signed with a new agent. All of that communication was appropriate and possible. And it's very difficult now. I actually, on my Instagram account, got a message from a guy I knew a long time ago, who used to have a podcast, who now has created a company to create electronic connection between casting directors and actors where you can now say thank you and say I've signed with a new agent or say I've, uh, I'm appearing on such and such. And I think it's a brilliant idea. I do too. Uh, uh, it's an absolutely, cause, because in this new world, establishing and maintaining a relationship with a casting office isn't possible. We're, we're more the Wizard of Oz than we ever were. So what does, what does someone who is, doesn't have representation, um, you know, an, an agent or a manager to do? Well, first of all, there's no shame in it. Everybody was born naked and without a SAG card. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so everybody started there. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you, um, you, if you want to be an actor, you got to take every opportunity to be an actor. And that's inter and, and you've got to realize that it's a self-realization uh, uh, journey. And you've got to, uh, uh, you know, I, I always joke and say, if you're a big baseball fan like I am, go to the opera. Mm -hmm. You know, see what that is like. If you uh, find yourself sitting at a dinner table with six people and everybody is has the same political beliefs, the same religious background, and the same, you know, whatever attractiveness or education or whatever, have dinner with somebody else. It, 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 since your imagination and your experience is pretty much all you got, you've got to spend your days expanding your experience and your imagination. Uh, um, do stuff you're not comfortable with. I just did a podcast with an acting teacher named Margie Haber. She has a new book out, which I think is brilliantly, I, I've never read a self-help book before. Her book is kind of a combination of a self-help book and an acting book, and it's called Fuck Your Comfort Zone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's good advice. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, you can be an actor every minute of every day. Uh, 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 even though you're not getting an opportunity to maybe get paid for it yet. And also, I am very, I think it's really important to not see the audition as um, a window to a job. It's an opportunity to do the thing you love. And if you get the job, obviously it's better. I'm not pretending it's not. <laughs> But you can't focus on the results. No. You want a successful, you want to create a successful character. You want to make that self-tape and satisfy yourself. You want to say you did the best that you could do. Absolutely. You want to be memorable. You want to be electric. You want to be authentic. You want to be truthful. You want to, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you want to do your work. And if you take your work seriously, you know, I, I'm grateful to you today, because, and I'm not in the least bit surprised, because you've always been a prepared actor. I'm not surprised that you're a prepared moderator, that you actually, I've been interviewed by people who have read a chapter, <laughs> maybe, a, you know, two pages, and that interview doesn't bring out anything from me. Uh, um, you know, I, um, preparation, that's, the, all of those, things, all of those things, are so important. And also, you know, you can get together with friends and read a script and, and then have a, a beer. Or you yeah. can make a movie on your phone. I will say, like, when I was starting out in New York, um, my manager at the time was insistent that if there were people doing a table reading or, you know, some, there was a new play or, you know, a friend, they said they made me do every table reading. Yeah. And so I got, I did a lot of them in New York. Um, and I bet you made relationships and you learned from your other actors. And I got, it made me a better cold reader. Sure. And it made me, um, I ended up going to, they were like, let's, we're going to take this one to Vassar to New York Stage and Film. I went up, I did the table read, and Scott Rudin was there. And he put me in a, you know what I mean? From that thing, he asked me to do a table reading for a project that he was trying to get Kevin Klein to do. And I, they called me. And I mean, I'm just saying, like, when people say, let's go do this student film, go yes. do the student film. Yeah. Go do everything. One do thing really no. does lead to another. The knee bone is really connected to the thigh bone. I mean, it really is the truth. And if you want to be a duck, you got to spend a lot of time quacking, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, more questions. Okay. All right. I'm going to... Okay. I have, um, this may be an obvious question, but with all these safe self-tapes, uh, holding sides and having them in the uh, taped audition is perfectly fine, correct? Yeah, you know, I've always called it a reading, and uh, I think a reading needs a piece of paper. But I think you should be so well prepared that you don't require it, but that it's there for you to fall back on in case you lose your place. But uh, you know, one of the crucial things about losing your place is don't lose your character when you lose your place. Uh, stay in the emotional reality of the character, then you'll find the words and then you go on. And guess what? Silence is pretty damn interesting. Um, uh, uh, if, but if you panic and freak and go outside the character to your actor nervousness, you're going to have a hell of a lot of trouble finding the connection again to go to the next beat. I never hold it. I mean, I, everybody's different. But if I'm playing a character who's a, a cokehead, who has to be able to say the lines with such, you know, speed that I can't, I try, you know, I need to get it in there. And if I rely on looking at it, then I, I, I'm not, ha I'll, I won't be happy with it. I'm just saying, everybody's different. Yeah. Some people are really good at holding it and making it seem like they're not. But one of the torturous things about watching an actor who's holding their script is watching the script turn into a fan, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. John, thank you so much. Thank you for your book. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate it. Stay warm. Good night. <laughs>